Coming in at number 10, we've got Genie. We'll start with one that seems to cause some continuity clashes, but it's plenty entertaining anyway. Throughout the 2099 universe, we meet descendants and followers of heroes that made Marvel so famous. Great grandchildren of classic heroes are all about, and oftentimes the original supers have died, disappeared, or become decrepit to fight crime. New folks come around to replace the old folks. It's the way of the world. However, in many Marvel stories, Doctor Strange manages to outlive all sorts of folks thanks to his magical abilities. This is not the case in 2099 though, as he He's nowhere to be found. In his place is another person who goes by the name Strange, and this time it's a woman. Also known as Genie, or possibly Sorceress Supreme, this magical mistress realized she had magical abilities and worked to perfect them on her own. Idolizing her older brother, she followed him one day and witnessed him being attacked by Skrulls. Attempting to scare them away, she tried to conjure an illusion of a Lovecraftian monster and ended up actually summoning an eldritch monstrosity. This didn't end up well for anyone, as she ended up accidentally killing her brother. Whoops. From there on, she underwent more training and started helping other heroes in various capacities. With all sorts of powers fueled by the mystic arts, she can do a whole lot of wicked things. From healing injuries to teleportation to casting sleep spells, she's got it all under control. Plus, she is immune to timeline distortions, which proves to be helpful quite often. So don't mess with Mademoiselle Strange. Coming in at number 9, Deadpool. Wade Wilson who? Well, actually it seems that Wade is indeed still around, but in 2099 his daughter Warda has taken up the mantle, and she seems to enjoy torturing him, which is interesting. Add in a mother who was once queen of the undead, and you've got one hell of a mix of powers. She has Wade's regenerative powers, as well as some possible vampirism from her mother's side. Absolutely wild. To make her potentially even more effective, she doesn't seem to share her father's sense of humor. Less goofing around, less cracking wise, and more violence. The weapon proficiency is still there too. Nice. Warda spends most of her time attempting to figure out where her mother is and eventually finds her true family, so good for her. Coming in at number 8, Moon Knight. Let's go Moon Knight, in 2099 they're actually on the moon, and she's no longer Mark Spector but an unknown individual with a totally secret identity. How cool is that? Wielding a bevy of powerful gadgets and weapons, Moon Knight acts as the server of vigilante justice on the moon-based city of Adelan. Stalking the knight, or whatever version of knight is on the moon, she keeps the many inhumans who call that place home as safe as she can. After accidentally wandering into the forbidden citadel of the Watcher, she convinces Uatu to let the Fantastic Four constructs to stick around longer until they've lived up to their former lives. Good on you, Moon Knight. Coming in at number 7, we've got Ghost Rider. To be honest, I'm a little disappointed that Nick Cage isn't the Ghost Rider in 2099. This implies that Hollywood's most controversial leading man doesn't make it until then, and that's just a shame. Thankfully, Ghost Rider is still wicked cool in the future and comes packing some new weapons and powers. Gone are the days that Ghost Rider is a literal magical skeleton flying around on his flaming motorcycle. In 2099, Vengeance got an update. Kenshiro Zero Cochrane, computer hacker extraordinaire, ends up with his mind inside of an insanely powerful robot body. A Cybertech 101 Warbot to be exact. And this robot is jam-packed with all sorts of futuristic weaponry, from eye lasers, to a hand that can transform into a whole bunch of weapons, to a retractable chainsaw embedded in his arm. Oh, and also a 50 caliber gun and grenades. Still a weapon for vengeance though, Ghost Rider manages to project the image of a flaming skull, just like the OG, using his holographic capabilities. Now that's how you future-proof your superhero. Coming in at number 6, Hulk. Our futuristic gamma-fueled beast is definitely a contender for strongest ever. However, unlike the original Hulk, he's not quite immortal. I won't get into the nitty gritty here, but even a base power higher than the first green giant isn't enough to keep you alive against all odds. Too bad, too, because this is a really cool reimagining of a classic hero. In 2099, a movie producer named John Eisenhart decides he wants to do a movie about the Knights of Banner. This group worships Bruce Banner like a god and tends to move around all over the place. When Eisenhart finds out he can't get the rights to their story, he turns them into the police but feels guilty afterwards. He tries to find a way to help them out, but gets caught in the blast of a gamma bomb, turning him into a brand new green monstrosity. He's got more base strength than the original Hulk, sharp teeth and claws useful for ripping and tearing, and even holds onto his human intelligence once transformed. Able to lift up to 150 tons and leap hundreds of feet in a single bound, this version of the Hulk is a force to be reckoned with. Coming in at number 5, we've got Thor. 
This might come as a bit of a surprise, but in the future, a lot of people worship superheroes. And a lot of the time, those who revere these supernatural figures are interested in attaining these godly powers for themselves. In 2099, a subset of people have decided to give themselves to Thor, mind, body, and spirit. Known as members of the Church of Thor, or Thorites, they all have the hallmarks of many other major religions, down to the places of worship and religious leaders. Cecil McAdams was a reverend of the Church of Thor, and was actually chosen to take up the mantle of the Norse god of thunder himself. Through technological advances and a whole lot of self-deception, McAdams ended up with almost identical powers to the god that he worshipped. This resulted in some less than stellar mental issues though, as he went a little power crazy and tried to rid an entire city of mortals. Coming to number 4, we've got Exodus. Born as Bennett du Paris back in the 1300s, this mutant is all about changing up the world order. He has and always will believe that mutants should be in charge of the world with humans as the inferior race. This was true before 2099 and remains true in said futuristic world. Showing up after a long, long sleep, Exodus attempted to force his rule upon X Nation. They weren't too happy with this, so Exodus defeated them. Using telepathy, teleportation, and resurrection, he's almost undefeatable. Factor in that he refused to save the humans before Mademoiselle Strange teleported the survivors away, and you've got one bad, powerful dude. Coming in at number 3, we've got Punisher. Even way off at the turn of the next century, Punisher's gotta punish. Frank Castle no longer wears the gigantic skull, instead it's a guy by the name of Jake Gallows, which is appropriate. This ex-Thorite actually grew up with Cecil McAdams as his reverend, but we'll save that story for a rainy day. He lost his family to violence and then came across the old war journals of the original Punisher. With this, he decided he would dedicate his life to punishing. At first, he was a member of the pay-per-use police service, but eventually ended up as Doom's Minister of Punishment. As one would expect, this makes it very dangerous to be deemed a criminal in the future. Strapping, angry, and constantly firing guns in both hands, the Punisher does what he does best. Hell, he even has a hand in killing the new Thor. Coming in at number 2, we've got Spider-Man. If you want a crazy origin story, look no further. In the future, there's one company that seems to have an upper hand over the rest. Alchemax. Miguel O'Hara was a scientist working for them, reluctantly performing genetic experiments on less than willing test subjects. After turning a man into a horrid beast that died quickly, O'Hara decided he'd had enough. However, when discussing this with his boss, he accepted a drink that turned out to be laced with Rapture, a highly addictive substance that bonds with the DNA of the person using it. This was supposed to keep O'Hara addicted, and therefore an employee of the company that produced it for the foreseeable future. In order to reverse this addiction though, O'Hara attempted to rewrite his own genetic code. This procedure was sabotaged by his boss, but ended up including some spider DNA in the process. Thus, Spider-Man 2099 was born. Jam-packed with spider powers, but actually lacking any form of spider sense, O'Hara decided to start fighting crime. Donning a spider suit to hide his identity, he puts his powers to use. Increased strength, agility, stamina, regeneration, some telepathy, claws and fangs, and even spinnerets that generate organic web, and more. Spider-Man is always a fan favorite, that's for sure. Finally, at number one, we've got Doctor Doom. Unlike most of the other heroes on this list, Doom isn't a clone or a copy or even offspring of another individual, it's still Doom. After disappearing for decades, Doctor Doom decided to upgrade his armor and make a triumphant return. And triumphantly return, he does. Coming back in full force, he manages to retake the United States and force his way into a leadership role. Like I said earlier, he employs Jake Gallows as his Minister of Punishment and begins ruling with an iron fist. There really is no stopping Doom, even in the future. Coming in at number 10, we've got Metalhead. Have you ever wanted to be made of something other than flesh? Most of us have probably dreamed of that at some point, whether after an injury or because other materials just seem so much cooler and stronger. Well, Metalhead, also known as Eddie, is living all of our dreams. Originally a member of the X-Men, Eddie was the group's strongman, metal transformer, and resident comic relief. Not a bad gig, right? Eventually they ran into another group of mutants, these ones a result of some wonky genetic experimentation known as the D-Gens. Eddie fought one of these freaks, Contagion, who could infect folks with a psychoactive virus that disrupts people's cellular structure. Interestingly enough, Eddie had taken on a metallic form when he was infected by the virus, causing it to act differently than expected. Instead of killing him, it made it impossible for him to return to his human form. He took on an odd, alloyed appearance and remained entirely metal for the remainder of his days. This wasn't all bad though, as he decided that he would join the freak show to pursue a particularly attractive freak, and now he was permanently resistant to all physical damage. Plenty of interesting attributes come from being made of metal, especially when you can change the type of metal you're made of to your advantage. Titanium if you don't want to break, copper if you want to conduct electricity, you name it. Plus, Metalhead is a sweet name. Coming in at number 9, we've got Fearmaster. 
Oh yeah, another excellent name. Working for Alchemax under the guise of Daryl King, this stylish and cruel super did all he could to leverage his power. As a board member and VP with his fingers in a lot of pies, he could easily be a supervillain without needing any sort of power. However, money and influence are just the beginning for Fear Master. Behind that conniving business person mask is the mind of a master planner. His intellect is quite formidable indeed. To make matters worse, he was granted a mutated hand by the alien Kalmizadek which allowed him to do a lot of heinous things. This strange alien hand granted him the power to calcify flesh, which is as grisly as it sounds, turn humans into minerals of his choosing, and even de-age elderly people. That last one could be used for a lot of good, but it's not often that Fear Master does good. In fact, he often uses his powers to create statues from the corpses of beautiful women, which he then puts on display. So he's got corporate power, transformative power, and a mind to put it all together. Just hope that you never get targeted by this megalomaniac. Coming in at number 8, we've got Serpentina. Another member of the 2099 X-Men, Kimberly Potters lives up to her name quite well. She could probably also be called something along the lines of Elastigirl, but I feel like we've seen that somewhere else. This green-clad super can extend pretty much every part of her body for a variety of uses. Scaling walls, bridging gaps, and of course, constricting enemies. There are more ways to use her powers, but I'll leave that up to you to figure out. She worked with the X-Men as they fought their way into the Singe Corporation to take revenge, and was fairly effective in helping her pals out. Unfortunately, this led to a run-in with Junk Pile, and things didn't go so well for our Teeny Tina. Her untimely sacrifice inspired a whole lot of new things within the X-Men. From Xion trying out his new healing abilities, to finally convincing Skullfire to permanently join their cause. She and Skullfire would meet again, but I'll leave that up to you to explore. Poor, poor Serpentina. You could have done so much more if only you had time. Coming in at number 7, we've got Skullfire. And speaking of him, let's talk about him. Also known as Timothy Fitzgerald, Skullfire was once a goofy yuppie living with his girlfriend. His mutant powers awoke in the most unfortunate way possible and killed his girlfriend in the aftermath. It turns out he's got the ability to absorb ambient energy and disperse it in destructive blasts. Sheesh, what a wake up call. At first, he could only use this power during stressful moments or when he was otherwise agitated. With the help of some other mutants though, he was able to get a better handle on his powers and use them with ease. This newfound power caused a shift in his personality too, giving him a devil may care attitude that often put him in very dangerous situations. Eventually, his body was destroyed, but that wasn't the last of Tim. Mm -mm, a ball of energy remained and was able to reconstitute his physical form. This new form had even more powers and could levitate with ease. Talk about personal growth. Coming in at number 6, we've got Cerebra. This name might sound familiar, even to those who aren't big 2099 fans. Cerebra has the ability to track down other mutants all across the globe, kind of like the technology Charles Xavier used in the original X-Men, known as Cerebro. This is no coincidence either. Cerebra chose her name for this exact purpose. She's not the most powerful mutant on the battlefield, but the work she does behind the scenes more than makes up for it. In addition to being able to find other mutants, she can manipulate people's nervous systems with a touch, either scrambling their signals and stunning them, or unlocking latent abilities that can be used later on. Ultimately though, Cerebra decided to team up with Doctor Doom instead of the 2099 X-Men she helped assemble. It was her task to locate the next mutant messiah, which is no small job. Coming in at number 5, we've got Ravage. Created by the legendary Stan Lee himself, Ravage is a superhero born from radiation. Shocker, right? Once the CEO of Eco, a subsidiary of Alchemax that was meant to help deal with environmental concerns, Paul Philip Ravage had it all. Over time, he noticed that there were some shady dealings happening within his company, and when he started to investigate, he was framed for a crime he didn't commit and had to go into hiding. Following exposure to radioactive materials, Ravage developed a bevy of wicked powers, including the ability to transform into a massive man-beast. He was surgically granted the ability to fire blasts of biokinetic energy from his hands, too. With physical abilities far beyond those of an average individual, Ravage is a combat expert. Add in retractable claws and incredibly sharp senses, and you've got one majorly strong superhero. If only he didn't retain some of his regular human limits. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Fantastic Four. One might expect that there'd be a brand new team of fantastic fighters in the future, but that's not exactly the case. Just like with Doom, these are the original supers from way back when, somehow brought into the year 2099. They retained all the powers they had when they started, making them invaluable to their allies. However, finding their way in the future proves to be quite a challenge. How did they get there? 
Where do they go next? Well, if any superhero can find out the answers to these questions, it's the four. So strap in and get ready for some interesting twists. Coming in at number three, we've got Captain America. Here's an interesting hero. Two personalities in one supplemented by the forced injection of super soldier serum, fighting as a part of Alchemax's adventures. That's a more complicated cap than we've seen in a while. Roberta Mendez was married to an Alchemax operative who made her take the super soldier serum. The thing is, Roberta doesn't know about her secret identity as Captain America. She's got two personalities inside of her, her own and Cap's. And when somebody says the phrase Avengers Assemble, old red, white, and blue bursts forth. When this happens, her peak physical form gets to shine. See, the serum does exactly what it did to Steve Rogers way back in the day. It pushed past all human limitations to create a soldier that simply can't be beat. This sometimes surprises Roberta, but she doesn't question it too much. Well, at first, anyways. Once the deed is done, someone can say Cap to Roberta and she'll return to her normal self. Or they can say he's the boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B if they're feeling cheeky. Coming in number two, we've got Daredevil. If you want to subvert expectations, this is a good way to do it. Long after Kingpin finally dealt with Matt Murdock, a new Daredevil appeared. This red-covered nightcrawler is the descendant of one of the two people I just mentioned. Can you guess which one? If you guessed the original Daredevil, Matt Murdock, you'd be wrong. Which leaves you with one other answer, Fisk. This time, it's Samuel Fisk, grandson of Wilson. He grew up hearing his father recount his grandfather's triumph over the hero of Hell's Kitchen and always felt guilty about it. So with his considerable inheritance, he made himself a battle suit and began to fight crime in a similar matter. However, with crime on the downswing in 2099, thanks to some sentinels, and Samuel being the latest figurehead of his family's crime empire, this led to mixed results. There was another 2099 Daredevil though, the grandson of Murdoch's friend Foggy Nelson, who fought against corporate criminals instead of street level ones. And finally, we've got Venom, the symbiote returns. And it's got a bunch of new tricks too. This time it chooses Kron Stone as its host. Kron is quite the choice considering that he's Miguel O'Hara's half-brother and was the man to call the hit on Jake Gallows' family. What a fun little connect the dots in 2099, right? All the classic Venom powers are here with a new acid spitting power to round out the arsenal. In fact, a lot of Kron's influence seems to give Venom acidic properties overall, all the way down to his blood. Number 10, Doctor Doom. The 2099 version of Doctor Doom has always been super interesting to me because he is even more anti-hero than his Earth 616 counterpart. For a time, people didn't even think that he was actually Victor Von Doom due to him being so young and originally entering 2099 without his standard facial scars or disfigurement. However, it was later revealed that it was actually Doom when he was forced to battle Eric Zerny, who was given some of his memories by Margareta, aka Neon Angel, in order to make the two duke it out. Neon Angel actually was sort of Doctor Doom's lover, but but they like to play these weird games with each other and this one ended up being viewed as her taking it a little too far. Doom won the fight and left her and Eric to die in their own base. Ooh, harsh. This Doctor Doom also successfully took over the US and had an era named after him, calling it Anno Doom in the year of Doom. He also is consistently working in this time period to protect the people of Latveria, which he does anyways normally, but you really get to see the 2099 version of Doom fight hard to save them all from all kinds of destruction. Number 9, Daredevil. There are actually two different versions of Daredevil in the 2099 alternate world. One is Samuel Fisk, the grandson of Wilson Fisk, who struggles with his feelings revolving around his grandfather. He becomes Daredevil, but also tries to carry on the Kingpin legacy, despite feeling remorse for his grandfather's actions. The other is Eric Nelson. Nelson is the one that is cooler than his Earth 616 counterpart to me. Don't get me wrong, Matt Murdock is awesome, but this version of the hero has a cooler costume to me. It's jet black, he looks like a wandering like black hole or some demon creeping out from the dark with bright red glowing eyes. He summons his light batons, which he uses as projectiles, or to fight close quarters with, which also just looks super cool. He's also a corporate lawyer. He actually gets his sensory powers from a man whose case he wouldn't take on, and was granted the powers in order to change his life from a safe one to a dangerous one, and open him up to the corruption all around him. And as such, he dedicates his life to becoming a vigilante to help fight this corruption. Some people have speculated that he may be related to Fox. Foggy Nelson, Murdoch's partner. Number 8, Venom. Venom in 2099 is just amazing because of his connection to Spider Man. Sure, Eddie Brock has a connection to the main continuity Spider Man. He feels that Peter Parker ruined his life and is looking for vengeance. Ah. But the 2099 version is even more closely tied. He is Spider Man's half 
brother. The two actually share a father in Tyler Stone, who also exists in more 2099 continuities than you could possibly imagine. Kron Stone is a twisted individual who enjoys inflicting pain on others and hates his half brother so much. That he tries to kill him. When he bonded with the Venom symbiote and later had it wrenched from his body, it was revealed that the bond went down to a molecular level, meaning that Kron's body actually possesses properties of the symbiote just by itself. This version of Venom is just a closer tied rival to Spider Man, especially when it was revealed in the Earth TRN 590 continuity that he knows 2099 Spider Man's secret identity. He knows. It's his half brother in that suit. Number seven, Hulk. In 2099, John Eisenhart becomes the Hulk. Remember, 2099 is a time in the Marvel verse where we don't have any heroes. All the heroes of the 20th century are gone. Corrupt corporations rule the world. It's a very real world we could be facing as we watch history progress in the present day and watch people get greedier and greedier. John Eisenhart is a ruthless studio exec tasked with getting the movie rights for the Knights of Banner, a cult that worships the long since gone hero of the Hulk and stands for honor and integrity who reside in California. Eisenhart learns that they are conducting gamma radiation experiments in an attempt to create a new Hulk to save us all from the evil corporations. When they won't agree to give him the rights to make a film about their story, he reports their illegal experiments to the police. This results in all of the knights getting brutally slaughtered in an attack by the police. Eisenhart manages to save one knight, Knight Gawain, from his death, but he feels super guilty about the other knight's deaths. And during the scuffle, the knight's gamma radiation device goes off and John is transformed into the Hulk. His version doesn't come with a feeling of guilt over being a monster, his version comes with a feeling of guilt of his actions. And through his time as Hulk, he actually fights to redeem himself. Number six, Dr. Octopus. So, there's an interesting thing to understand about the 2099 universe, and that is that it's comprised of multiple Earths. There is Earth 928 and Earth TRN 590 primarily, but there's also a bunch of other ones. This is important to understand because there are some characters who are different depending on which Earth we are talking about, and TRN 590 has been used to change identities of characters or to retcon characters' backstories or even introduce some new characters. This villain, though, only exists in TRN 590 Earth. Not much is known about this version of Dr. Octopus, so you might be wondering how I know that they are better than our 616 Doc Ock. But that's a simple query to answer. They're actually a freaking octopus! Well, I mean, they're still humanoid. But this version of Doc Ock is an Atlantean scientist who is a humanoid octopus. So, yeah, just basically the coolest looking and the most sensical in terms of his name. Number five, Moon Knight. You don't need to know much about this version of Moon Knight to know how much cooler she is. If you are a fan of Moon Knight, you will know that he is often presented as someone who gets his power from the Egyptian moon god Khonshu, and thus the moon itself. Well, in 2099, this Moon Knight actually fights crime on the moon, where both immigrants of the earth and the inhumans reside. She defends those who live on the moon, acting as their protector. Many believe that she is actually a ghost. Oh yeah, and this version of Moon Knight is obviously also a woman. We never get to know her identity sadly, but imagine how powerful Moon Knight would be on the moon. What? Number 4, Vulture. The 2099 version of Vulture is just a more terrifying version than that of Earth 616. Not much is known about him, we don't even know his real name, but you don't need to know that to be scared of this guy. The Vulture of Earth 616, Adrian Toomes, is usually presented as being old and kind of frail looking, bald and lean like a vulture. 2099 Vulture, especially in Earth 928, is Swole, a big muscle bound man who stumbles upon a flying contraption that's possibly the one that was last used by the former villain of the main continuity. Who knows? This vulture is also a cannibal and was even a cannibal before he adopted the alias. All I can imagine is him circling a dying human and then swooping in for a bite of their flesh. Ugh, scary stuff. Number three, Spider Man. In the 2099 universe, Miguel O'Hara is Spider Man. What's so much better than him when compared with his Earth 616 counterpart? His suit is pretty cool, all iterations of it, but I especially like his red spider mask that he wears, the spikes that usually adorn his arms. And also, he isn't perfect. Not that Peter Parker is perfect either, but what I really like most about 2099 heroes is that they generally tend to live in a very ignorant world. 2099 is a very 
corrupt time, and most people are too full of themselves or too busy to notice, much like the world we live in today in 2019. Miguel ends up discovering his ignorance in his journey to become a hero, which is what makes him so great and so relatable. He's not perfect. He's arrogant, ignorant, and sometimes downright cruel. But as he becomes a hero, he becomes more self-aware and ultimately a better person. Number two, Ghost Rider. Because he's so much more future in a way that is amazing. This version of Ghost Rider imagines him tied to a technological world, not a magical one, making him, in a sense, more realistic. Well, realistic if you believe in the ultimate power of AI in the future. Kenshiro Zero Cochrane was a hacker who ran with the gang Hotwire Martyrs, futuristic worlds where we have gangs of hackers. I super dig it. Their gang was in possession of some heavily encrypted info when they were attacked by the artificial kids. With a Z, of course. Kids. The hacker kids ended up killing the martyrs, but Cochrane managed to get away. However, he had been shot by a tech bullet that was eating away at his nervous system, effectively killing him. Before he died, he managed to transfer the file to his girlfriend and download himself into cyberspace. There he awoke to the Ghostworks, a network of AI intelligence that wanted Cochrane to return as their agent and help fix the world, which they feared was on a decline. Should civilization collapse, tech would also be threatened and they would kind of cease to exist. They wanted to fix the way things were run so that this wouldn't happen. Cochrane agreed and was downloaded into a war bot, becoming the new Ghost Rider. Kind of a combo of Ghost Rider and Terminator. Pretty cool. Number one, Alchemax. If you're fairly familiar with Marvel's 2099 continuity, you will probably have heard of Tyler Stone and Alchemax. Alchemax was originally an evil corporation that is often at the center of most conflicts in the 2099 world. That is when Doctor Doom isn't. It's better than its 616 counterpart because it actually ends up being more important in the 2099 world. It also goes from being a corporation that provides many different services and products to consumers in a way that gives it an evil amount of power, they even have their own division of the police, to being run later by Miguel O'Hara, 2099 Spider-Man, and being repurposed as a good corporation. Meanwhile, on Earth 616, it's just a small fish in an ocean full of larger villainous threats. Number 10, Creation. Stay Stan Lee came up with the idea for Marvel 2099 when he began to collaborate with John Byrne on Ravage 2099, a comic that was intended to explore the future of the Marvel Universe. It was the early 90s and society was becoming worried about what the next millennium would hold, and Stan wanted to explore that and try to reassure the population that things would be fine, so he decided to explore the later years of the 21st century. The collaboration with John Byrne fell through however, but Stan was onto something and wanted to pursue the idea further. Joey Cavalieri was very enthusiastic and put himself on the sheet for an entire Marvel 2099 collection, and Joey became responsible for overseeing it. It started in 1992 and concluded in 1996, and had a whole roster of heroes, both old and new. But if it ended in 1996 then, why are we talking about it now? Well that leads me into number 9, being revived in November. Revealed at the Diamond Retailer Lunch at San Diego Comic Con, the Marvel 2099 comics will be getting revived and getting new releases starting in November of 2019. This was announced by Marvel with the teaser, 80 years ago it was 1939, 80 years from now it will be 2099. Demonstrating that we are currently at the halfway point between the beginning of Marvel and the furthest point we've seen. Not much is known about what comics will be coming back at the time of recording, but it's safe to say that the original lineup of Doom 2099, Punisher 2099, Ravage 2099, and Spider-Man 2099 can be expected. But for sure the last one. Spider-Man was the most popular 2099 incarnation and has been in several other forms of media after the series ended, even being transported to present day for a time. Who do you want to see come back in 2099 or even someone new in 2099? Let me know in the comments. Also someone count how many times I'm going to be saying 2099. Number 8 Why It Stopped Marvel 2099 was one of the casualties of war as Marvel Comics battled with potential bankruptcy as changes in leadership came almost on a weekly basis. As a result of the potential loss of the company they had to downsize. Joey Cavalieri was one of the people let go and basically every other writer who had to do with 2099 resigned in support of Joey. Marvel hired replacements to wrap up 2099 over the next little bit. Despite it only running for a few years, it was hugely successful overall. Spider-Man 2099, Miguel O'Hara has appeared many more times after this, be it as an interdimensional superhero with a team called the Exiles, or as the star of his own book. The 
The timeline has lost some cohesiveness, however, due to the lack of constant editorial direction, but Marvel, I'm sure, will aim to improve that with their new releases, hopefully. Number 7, Reading Order. If you are familiar with the original Marvel 2099 comics, you may know of all the heroes that were used. Some were brought back, some in other forms, and some were created new for this series. The whole of Marvel 2099 had 271 issues, and actually has a reading order if you're looking to catch up. I obviously can't read out the full order, but here are some notable points. It starts with Spider-Man 2099 issues 1 to 3, followed by Doom 1 and 2. After that, Ravage, who was a new character for the 2099 series, issues 1 to 3, Punisher 1, and then Spider-Man 4 to 9. Later on, you will get 2099 Unlimited number 1, which seems to be more of an Avenger-style comic, and then after a few more issues, Unlimited number 2. After that, you'll need Punisher 7 to 9, Doom 10, and X-Men 2099 1 to 3. Skipping ahead to Unlimited 4, you'll find Thor Corp number 3, which seems to be more of a tie-in since the first two don't appear on this list. After Spider-Man 22, you'll get into Ghost Rider. There is a lot of comics to read and I can't list them all, so there is a link that you can go to in order to find the full order. It'll be in the description. In at number 6, released games. Spider-Man 2099 appeared in at least two games to my knowledge. The first one being Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, where you control four different versions of Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. And its sequel, Spider-Man Edge of Time, which has you control Peter Parker and Miguel O'Hara. Miguel is by far a Spider-Man who is iconic in his own right, as well as a fan favorite, which would explain why he would appear more than his other counterparts, such as Spider-Man Noir. Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions came out in September of 2010 for consoles and November 2010 for PC, and Spider-Man Edge of Time came out in October of 2011 for consoles, including the Nintendo 3DS, which is the console I used to play it. This game was honestly my first introduction to Miguel, and I was immediately fascinated by his story and spider Sona. While he has appeared in games, however, there is one game that was supposed to include him and others. And that brings us to number 5, Cancelled Game. The Marvel 2099 continuity was actually intended to have a game that was set to release in December of 1996. It was called Marvel 2099 One Nation Under Doom, and was going to be for the PlayStation and Windows 95, developed by Mindscape Inc. It was to be loosely based on the storyline by the same name in the Doom 2099 comics, and was envisioned as a 2D side-scroller with 3D characters. By May of 1996, CD-ROM and video demos were being shipped to game magazines for pre-release reviews, along with one-page brochures. The first demo was shown at E3 and had a playable level with the Punisher. The game was also supposed to have Spider-Man, X-Men, Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four, and Hulk 2099 as playable characters, along with 40 additional unnamed characters that would appear as NPCs. The game was never officially cancelled, however, as the production just slowed down and stopped due to financial troubles and layoffs occurring near the time of release. With the new launch, could we see a game similar to this be created? Hmm. In at number 4, Movies. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was an incredible movie and brought several different incarnations of the Spider-Person together on the big screen. But one iconic portrayal was missing. Miguel O'Hara was not in the main storyline of the Spider-Verse movie, but he did appear at the end credit sequence, appearing in the iconic No You Spider-Man meme from the 60s Spider-Man cartoon where two people in Spider-Man costumes are pointing at each other. Love this meme. This I can honestly say came as a shock to me since Miguel is my favorite Spider-Man and I had expected him to be in this movie, but this has further implications for the next Spider-Verse movie, as he got to that meme via a transporter that seemed to be like a watch, so this could open up a whole plethora of other Spider-Man for future movies, maybe even a Spider-Man as a villain, like the Cancerverse Spider-Man. In at number 3, Caused the Spider-Verse. With the undeniable success of Spider-Man 2099, you can honestly say that he could be the reason the Spider-Verse exists. Sure, the multiverse was going to happen anyway, but with Miguel they experimented, no pun intended, and it paid off. So they felt more confident to experiment in other ways, bringing Spider-Man into the noir scene for example, or making him a pig, I guess. You could contribute the continued use of Spider-Gwen and Miles to Spider-Man 2099 and the entire 2099 series in all honesty. While yes, Spider-Man was the most popular character from the 2099 series, the series helped show executives that experimenting and being creative is a good thing that pays off, especially when we've seen the same people fight over and over. Sure, you can throw a death in to spice things up, but if you bring a version of your Yourself, who isn't even really yourself from the future into the mix, you've got something so spicy even the devil couldn't ingest it without ruining his rectum. And at number 2, Variations. With 2099 being so far away, especially when this series was created, the writers and artists could obviously take some creative liberties. More than normal at least. 
I should probably say that when talking about superheroes. For example, Dr. Octopus 2099 is not the spawn of Otto Octavius. In fact, he is a former Atlantean scientist and an expert in xenobiology, and looks like an actual octopus. He appears in Spider Man 2099 number 1, as well as Spider Man 2099 Civil War 2. Electro 2099 is not a human, but in fact a service android who was hit by a burst of electricity, causing him to gain electricity powers and sentience. Doom 2099 is a freaking president, and Captain. America is a woman who leads the Avengers and works as an employee at Alchemax, an evil corporation. The variations they threw into the 2099 heroes and villains are incredible and they deserve to be celebrated in the new stories. Hopefully they don't change them up. At least too much. Finally, at number one, how it ended. We talked about why the series ended, but how it ended in comics themselves is totally mind boggling. The series wraps up in 3099 with Miguel O'Hara doing his best to maintain peace in the universe. Yeah, you may be confused because I said the year 3099, which would mean Miguel is a thousand years old, something that would normally only be achievable by a god, such as the god of thunder, Thor himself. Yes, while it may sound far fetched, remember the writers of the projects had switched, so the writers that the end were not the writers who had started the series. Where did these new writers take it, you ask impatiently? Well, the series wrapped up with 2099 Manifest Destiny, which was used to wrap up any loose ends it could, but also had Miguel O'Hara wielding Mjolnir and using it to hammer out peace in the universe over the course of a thousand years. Yeah, the series ended with Miguel becoming immortal and pulling a cap. What the hell? 